If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Peter, that's where we'll kind of look to begin. This is our second week of Christians in Culture. We started two weeks ago, and last week had Byron and Snajana and the kids and Hawatha here. <laughs> the kids, and that kind of throws Hawatha in there with them, I guess, but... Uh, they were here doing the report and great work that they're they're doing in, in Guatemala City and the great plans they have. But we are back on track now for the for the rest of the quarter. In First Peter, <clears throat> as we think of this idea of Christians in culture, in First Peter, Peter opens the letter with he addresses it to those who have been dispersed, those in the, the diaspora, those who are the Christians who've had to go all over the place, trying to find places to live, trying to get away from uh, all, all through the Roman Empire, trying to find places to escape some persecution. And then in chapter 2, verse 9, he starts to kind of give them some identity. This goes right with kind of what we're doing here. And he says, in begins to describe them in chapter 2, verse 9, the chosen race, that they're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his possession. And then he says that you weren't a people, and now you are a people. So he's giving this them this identity of uh, kind of a reminder of who they are. And then if you get down to verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sin sinful desires that wage war against your soul. So he describes them as aliens and strangers. Different translations use different words, but he says that you are not like the people around you. And he said, it isn't because of your race, it's not because of your ethnicity, it's not because of your anything other than the fact that you're in the kingdom of God and that your citizenship is in the kingdom of God and not in wherever it is that you end up landing in this dispersion. What he's saying is, as Christians, wherever we go, we're in an unusual and what in many ways you could say is a foreign or alien culture. And that's really what, what we're going to be dealing with this quarter. Um, as we look through several different topics, what we're going to be dealing with, and I don't know if I explained this very well the first week or not, but what we're going to be dealing with is not issues and how we solve them necessarily. We are going to look at some particular issues our, our culture, contemporary culture, is dealing with and, see, and look at it through scriptures, through the lens of scripture. But mainly what I want us to look at is how are we going to respond to that? What are we supposed to do with this as Christians? The fact that we are aliens and strangers because of our faith in Jesus Christ, our relationship with God through Jesus Christ makes us aliens and strangers. So what do we do with that? I uh, asked Jeremy, Jeremy so aptly volunteered to lead us in a prayer after I chased him down. <laughs> Jeremy's going to lead us in a prayer. Any, any particular prayer requests? Right off the top of your head, just to make it worse. Maybe you have to write stuff down, too. Okay, if you would, please. Wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's Canada Martinez, John's dad, her, her father-in-law, John's dad has, what was it again? Blood disease, kidney, blood disease, kidney failure, and prostate cancer. I did see that the other day on social media or somewhere that John's dad's and her father-in-law, John's dad is in not very good health right now. And that's a little, obviously very concerning. So remember... Canada's father-in-law, John's dad. Anything else? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, approach your throne right now um, only because you have provided a way for us to do so. We're studying this quarter about how we are aliens in a foreign land. Father, we were once... Uh, foreigners to you. We, we once had no relationship with you, but you uh, fixed that problem when you allowed your son to die on the cross for us so that we could no longer be strangers, but could actually be family to you. We could call you father. 
And Father, we pray to you right now that you would please be with us during this class. Help us to really dive deep into your word and let it impact our, our hearts and let it impact our lives and the way that we live our lives and commit to uh, living and being in the world, but not of the world. Father, I pray that you would please uh, be with all those that are sick, all those that are struggling with different ailments, struggling with different issues in their lives. Father, I want to pray for uh, Canada's father-in-law who is going through some really severe health problems right now. Uh, we want to lift him up in prayer, Father, and uh, pray that all of the treatments, all of the doctors, all of the nurses, everybody who is helping him would be able to do that in the best way possible to expedite his healing and uh, so that he can make a full recovery. Father, I want to pray for my friend and co-worker, Adam, uh, who, is, uh, who has traveled back east to be with his father who is uh, about to pass away and pray that you would be with him and the family, all of his brothers, his mom, uh, help them through this difficult time and provide peace for them and uh, help Adam to be a, a source of peace um, and wisdom for his family. Father, thank you so much for this time and uh, help us uh, by opening our hearts to your word and uh, provide us with your Holy Spirit so we can understand it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jeremy. In Acts chapter 17, as we look at this idea of culture and, and how we relate, uh, one of the things that we talked about two weeks ago is all these different views of how, how Christians, how religious people, I guess, if you could think of it that way, deal with culture. And uh, we, we looked at... Um, Oh, the guy, I can't even think of the author's name now, but his, his writing on, on Christ and culture. And there was Christ above culture, which was basically just isolate yourselves, which, you know, we, we came to the conclusion we can't do that. Then we can't fulfill the rest of what we're supposed to do. And then there was Christ in culture where we kind of just blend everything up together and we can't do that either. And then there's the, the other three positions that kind of moderate all of that. In Acts chapter 17, I think Paul gives us a model of and we, we actually could spend a whole lesson on just looking at how Paul engages the culture that he's dealing with there in Acts chapter 17 in Athens. He, he begins, you know, when the, the, the philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics have called him in and said, hey, we just want to hear what this guy has to say because they like to listen to stuff. And he begins his address by just uh, uh, telling them what he saw. He says, you know, I walked around your city. And I saw all this stuff about who you are. He said, it, it, the, the text actually says that he, look, he, says he looked carefully, that he, he really you know, checked out the stuff that was in their city. He looked at their objects of worship, acknowledging the fact that, yeah, you, you people have a, have a mindset to worship. Um, he read their literature. I mean, he, he read their literature enough to quote their literature to him, which would have been, you know, that, that would have been... Ex, uh, a, a way for him to be accepted. In fact, he quotes their literature and puts a, a God spin on it. He says, I mean, he has, he uses what their poets say and say that this is the same thing God says. We all come from the same God. Um, his commitment or his intent was to change those people. I mean, that's, that was Paul's intent wherever he went. I mean, I think we'd all agree with that. But he didn't go in there and immediately start blasting them. He didn't say, I can't believe you people worship Diana and Pan and all these, diff all these different gods that you have. I can't believe you do that. That's so st too stupid. I mean, how far would that have gotten him? Probably dead. <laughs> I mean, it probably, probably wouldn't have gotten him very far at all. But instead, he observes what's going on around him and then works it into conversation. See, we don't have to oppose everything about culture. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff in our culture. We know that. But what we have to do is be observant, like Paul was, and, and, and find those things, find those places, those incident instances that, that people do things that are good, and, and then work from those. Like I said, I, I think Paul gives us this idea that, that not everybody, even within our culture, contemporary culture, as messed up as it may be, not everybody is blatantly godless. 
but maybe people are just God unaware. You know, maybe people just haven't, just don't know yet. We're, we're going to look at some statistics about our culture that are pretty sad. But then we're going to look at some statistics that should give us a little bit of hope. Uh, and as we think through this quarter, keep in mind, and we'll refer back to this, how Paul dealt with those people there in Acts chapter 17. Didn't just jump right down their throats and tell them how wrong they were. He'll, that's, he saves that for another time. In this place where he's kind of the one out of sorts, he takes what he knows about them and says, hey, I've seen this about you. I've seen this. I've seen this. Let me tell you some stuff that I know about a God that you don't know who is the God and just walks right into it. Um, so as, as we, with those things in mind, thinking about the fact that w what we are dealing with is um, a culture. Oh, let me just ask you this instead of me assuming. Our culture thinks what about God? Fill in the blank. That God is a theory. God's a crutch. That God doesn't exist. Our culture thinks fill in the blank about the Bible. Hmm? Made by men, Made by men that it's a, just a man written thing. Full of inaccuracies. Hmm? Just words. Just words on a page. Anybody could have written them. And as we think about, I mean, if, 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 if I could pull up, you know, uh, any, any news page on, on the fr front page on any w news website, we could find several items where we'd go, Ugh, that's our culture. That's what we deal with. But as we think about how Paul dealt with those people in Athens, and we think about how we're to deal with our culture today, we talked two weeks ago about this verse that is, you know, as much as anything, I mean, I don't know how you describe it. This is kind of an anthem verse for, for Christians everywhere, for religious people everywhere, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What we have to remember as we go through all this is this part. That this culture that we're talking about is the world. That as sinful as people may be, God so loved them that he gave his only son. We don't have the right to say, well, I'm not going to mess with those people. That's that Christ above culture. We don't have the right to say, well, those people aren't worth talking to because they're not going to listen anyway because they're terrible humans. Because God so loved them that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe, and you talk about all that believe means, that believe is the same word for obey and all that stuff, but, and, and, and all that matters, and we'll deal with that too. But we have to remember that those are the people that God gave his son for. And, and we have to be cognizant of that as we deal with culture. And again, so our question is, how do we respond to all that? So let me ask you some questions to start with here. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., very famous speech, says, I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. What's he talking, what, where does he get that reference? Hmm? The Bible. Way to be generic. <laughs> what, what's he talking about? Moses, the promise, the land promised, promised to the nation of Israel. Uh, why, there's a, you know, when a uh, guy leaves the, you know, New York Yankees and goes to play for somebody else, and then a few years later gets traded back. They say the prodigal son has come home. What does that mean? Where do they get that? It's in the Bible. Come on. Uh, Jesus' parable of, of the prodigal son, the older brother parable, the, the father who runs the Bible language that we hear just in our culture. Uh, the east entrance of the U.S. Supreme Court building. There are lawgivers, name me one of them. Well, I was going to say, just guess. <laughs> Moses. Actually, it's Moses, Confucius, and some guy named Salon, who is a Athenian statesman, lawmaker, and poet. So there you go. But there's Moses on the Supreme Court building. Uh, who's Solomon's father? David. Very good. Uh, whose life did David spare while he was asleep in a cave? 
It's all very good, very good. Psalm 119, this one's tougher. Psalm 119 is primarily about what? God's word, very good. Uh, where'd the angel tell Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus to flee? Egypt, very good. See, you guys are way ahead of this. Finish this. But store up for yourselves. But store up for yourselves. Treasures, treasures in heaven. This is from what famous speech, if you will? Sermon on the Mount. Very good. Very good. What the sign hanging over Jesus' cross say? The King of the Jews. Very good. Um, here, okay, we'll end with this hard, hardest. Oh, no. Who led the people out of Egypt? Moses. Uh, what happened at the wedding in Cana? Water to wine. Okay, the final and the hardest one. How many churches are addressed in Revelation 2 and 3? Seven. You all, whether you answered out loud or just kind of mumbled along, you all just passed a test that no one else in a particular survey even came close to passing. Um, a late night, and I, I don't have the statistics on that, just you just have to believe me on that. Late night talk show host asked his audience the following Bible questions. Name one of the Ten Commandments. The first answer that person raised their hand said, I want to answer, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> <clears throat> Name one apostle, and it was crickets in the audience. Name the Beatles, and it was John, Paul, George, and Ringo. If you didn't know, that's who the Beatles are. And when you, when you hear those things, and you hear the, the fact that it was 11% of, of the people that answered the questions that I gave you, 11% of people, 11% of the people that took that out of a 1,400 and something got at least 25% of those right. And for, for us, the Wednesday night crowd, you know, those are, those are Bible answers. You, you're just supposed to know those, right? Um, and it's kind of funny when you, the answers from the, top, from the late night show, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of revealing, right? I mean, it, it shows our culture. It, it, shows, it shows where we are. Uh, a, a culture that, that, like it or not, we claim a biblical heritage, I mean, we, we, we make a big deal about our forefathers who founded this country on godly principles and whatever. We're to the point now where you can't name a, an apostle, but you can name the Beatles. I mean, that's, that's, that's where we are. Uh, according to a Barna study, if, uh, through this class, you'll hear me refer to Barna, Pew Research, Lifeway Research. These are, relig these are organizations that do religious surveys. Not necessarily to religious people, but they're religious questions. Uh, Barna survey, 41% of adults read the Bible outside of worship, when they did this, had read the Bible outside of worship the prior week, 41%. That's not great, it's not as bad as maybe we would have thought, but it was significantly, significantly lower from a decade previous. The, the, the decade before, the, the same type question was asked 10 years earlier, and it was in the low 50s, so it's down quite a bit. Uh, one third of Americans strongly disagree that Jesus sinned. So that means two thirds of people think, well, he probably did sin. He's a person. Uh, less than a quarter strongly reject the idea that Satan is not a real sp spiritual being, 24%. In other words, 75% of people say Satan's probably not even real. <clears throat> okay. How about our kids? Many United States, many teens in the United States know the basics about the Bible. 72% of the, the teens correctly identified that it was Moses who led the, led the nation of Israel out of bondage. That's much higher than the overall survey. So where are they getting that? I don't know. But less than half of American teenagers, 49%, knew what happened at the wedding at Cana. But even at that, one out of four asked that question, refused to even give an answer. They're like, I have no idea what that even means when you're asking me about a wedding at Cana. Um, and what's even more significant is teenagers who identify themselves as church-going. 
were not very much better. 44% could identify any quote from the Sermon on the Mount. So, those aren't all that cheerful. When you think about how, what does that say about where we are in Bible knowledge? What does that say about where we are as a society, as our culture, in our understanding, our delving into, our even giving much time to think about the Bible? Well, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture. Um, but, like I said, there's better news coming, too. Okay, so... All those statistics. Let me ask you, let me shift gears on you here. Let's say you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you some bad news. You've got such and such disease. You don't have much time. Uh, we're not even really sure how to treat this. There's some options. But you're welcome to go get a second opinion. Do you go get a second opinion? Oh, yeah, pretty much everybody does. Do you go to this guy? Or, I mean, do you go to a faith healer to say, hey, listen, I, don't, I went to the doctor. I'm not ready for any of that. Can you just do this? Or, I mean, would you, eat, would you go to the guy who says, you know, the, some of the new thinking, would you go to the guy who says you got to eat a certain amount of herbs and stack some rocks a certain way and look at the stars out of one of your eyes, you know, all that kind of stuff. W would you go to any of those kind of people? Why not? No evidence. I don't have any trust in that. You would go to the person who's, who's supposed to have the knowledge. You'd go back into your doctor's office, look at his library in his office, and go, oh, this is the guy. This is the guy I need. Okay, doctor, I'm back. What do we do with this? I mean, you got all this stuff. Hit me. What, how do we approach this? And he goes, I haven't read any of those. I mean, I don't know what's in those. And you go, no, no, listen, you told me I have this disease. You've diagnosed it. You told me we can, we can work. Well, I, well, yeah, we can work on it, but I don't know what to do. I mean, I've got a bunch of books, but I don't know what's in there. What would you do? <laughs> Run? Run to your lawyers? Maybe? Leave. You'd get out. Do we do that? We culturally we gripe about our culture. We don't know the 41% can't even name what happened to this or that. And we look at these statistics. And then people say, you, person, you're a Mr. Bible believer. What do I do about this? And we go, I don't know. I mean, I'll see if my preacher knows because I don't know. I don't know what's in those books. Do we do that? If we do that, we're adding to the belief that the Bible has no point. We're adding to the fuel. We're adding fuel to the fire that says we don't need the Bible. Because even those people who say they believe it don't know what's in it. So what do we do? What do we do about this? This can't be us. We, we can't be that way. Um, our, our conviction is, and I'll, I'll say that, I believe this is, I can speak for everybody here. Our conviction is the Bible has authority and the Bible has relevance. Beyond any other, beyond, certainly beyond any other writings. And we'll look at some statistics maybe this week, maybe not. Um, but what this hinges on and what, what we have to remember is what this, this, this all hangs on Jesus. You know, Jesus is the one in John chapter 5, verse uh, 39. Jesus says that the scriptures bear witness of me. The authority and the relevance of scripture and Jesus are tied together. And we, we have a culture that says, I, I, I want Jesus. I want to have a relationship with Jesus, but I don't want that Bible thing. It's all old, outdated stuff. Jesus himself says they're intertwined. The, 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 the two go together. The, the concepts go together. The ideas go together. Um, it's called reciprocal testimony. That the living word, Jesus, testifies to the written word, which the written word then testifies to him. And it just kind of goes back and forth. So you can't have one without the other. No matter what our culture seems to want. I want to love Jesus. I want to, have, I want to be able to pray to God while I'm out in the woods. While I don't want to go to church anywhere. I don't want that Bible telling me what to do. But man, I love Jesus. That's not how it works. So for us, again, what do we do? We can't be the people who scream and holler about how bad culture is and how 
terrible people are about not knowing the Bible, not wanting to listen to the Bible, if our Bibles look like this. If we're not people of the Bible, then we need to zip it about our culture. <clears throat> our culture is bombarded with content. You know, you know what I mean when I say that? It's, that's, it's, almost, it's actually it's become a social media hashtag. If somebody just puts out something that's just information, they put hashtag content, because it's just filler. I mean, there are... It, it, it never ceases to amaze me. The, uh, we'll be talking about something at home, and in a heartbeat, one of my kids can pull up a video or a meme or something, go, oh yeah, that's, look, that's this. And I'm like, because there's content, there's stuff everywhere. And our culture is bombarded with content, but our culture is dying for substance. Our culture is desperate for something to hang on to. Um, here's some, now the positive. Here's some good statistics. And I didn't get, the, I was wanting to make these into slides and I didn't get a chance to. 88%, this is from 2015. Yeah, <laughs> it is. 88% of people in America own a Bible. 80% of people in America say the Bible is sacred. 61% of people surveyed in this survey said they wish they read the Bible more. These aren't, these aren't Christian. These aren't religious. This is just a random sampling of people. <clears throat> Six out of ten Americans who have no faith or identify as atheists own a Bible. I don't have any faith. I'm an atheist but I've got this big black book sitting on my coffee table because my grandma gave it to her, or whatever. Ooh, sorry. Eight out of ten, 80 percent of Americans identify the Bible as sacred literature without any prompting from these interviewers. Compared to the large number of people believing the Bible to be sacred, fewer than one out of ten, eight percent, said that they thought the Quran was sacred. And what are we told? Well, I I Islam's taken over America. That's not what that says. This says that people have an interest in the Bible. People think the Bible is valuable. Maybe they don't believe it. Maybe they don't understand it the way we do. But they're not discarding it the way we think they are. People have a higher esteem for the Bible than I think we give them credit for. Because, and these statistics prove that. Just over three quarters, 77%, believe the values and morals of America are declining, and when asked what is to blame for this decline, one third of those responding attribute that to a shift, attribute that shift to a lack of Bible reading. Nearly six out of ten adults, 56 percent, believe the Bible has too little influence in American society. That's more than four times the percentage of people who think the Bible has too much influence. So let me ask you this. We have a culture that seems desperate for something. something, something to grab a hold of, something to, to bring meaning to their life. I'm, I'm sorry, I've got I to finish this. You've got to hear this about young people. Because this is the group that, that, that we have such an issue with, for whatever reason. This, this group calls it the mosaics because they include part of Gen Z and part of the millennials. So they take ages 18 to 28. Interested in the Bible's wisdom on different, different topics here. And they have all adults and then these mosaics, 18 to 28 years old. People who are ruining the world, right? Dealing with illness and death. All adults say they 28% want the Bible's wisdom. 33% of the 18 to 28 year olds say they want the Bible's wisdom. Addressing family conflicts, all adults 24%, mosaics 40%. Parenting, all adults 22%, 18 to 28 year olds 42%. They're leading the way. That age group is the group saying, what is this Bible? I want to know what it says. There's, there's something there that obviously has worked for centuries or you know, at least several decades that isn't working anymore. Romance and sexuality. All adults, 17%. I'm not reading Song of Solomon. Mm -mm. Mosaics say 30%. Dating and relationships, all adults, 16 Mosaics, 35%. Influence of technology, 12% from all adults, 14% Mosaics. And dealing with divorce, all adults, 8%. Mosaics, 15%. So that tells us 
that we have a culture that we've decided doesn't want to hear anything about the Bible. But maybe they do. And maybe we need to figure out why we can't get those numbers higher. Okay, so we have 10 minutes to cover like a whole lot. <clears throat> so why do we study the Bible? Because that's, that's, that's really what, what it comes down to. If, if, if we're going to try and influence this culture, the culture we live in, if we're going to try and influence them to think the Bible has some relevancy and some authority, we have to know it. Because we're the ones carrying the banner, right? We're the, we're the doctor at the doctor's office with all the books on the shelf that, we're, that the patients are coming in going, you got the answers. You're supposed to know the answers. Help me out here. So why do we do it? This guy's a professor, Gerald Burns from Notre Dame. He says, you can't really study Western literature intelligently or coherently without starting with the Bible. You're simply ignorant of yourself if you don't know the Bible. Why is that? Why, why, why would you have to study the Bible to study Western literature? It's supposed to be part of our founding. It's history. It's where we come from. Do you know how many, well, like, like I said, we, we throw around the reference to the prodigal son. That's a Bible thing. We, that's, that's in sports. That's in business. Brad? A, tons of literature reference Bible things. Absolutely. Dana said it, it's, it's a, common, a common thread, in, especially literature from the 17th, 18th century. It was the one thing that everybody had access to. Somebody else had a hand somewhere. Yes. Absolutely. It was a huge influence on just the way people wrote, the way people looked at things. Absolutely. Some of the first books that generations of people learned to read from was the Bible. Uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, no, that's not it. That's not right. Uh, that's what I get for trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, some guy. Yeah, some really, really good writer. The book it was a miniseries when I was a kid. East of Eden. Do you remember that? That's about the Garden of Eden. Uh, Rich, or no, what was that other thing? Man, I had a list of these today and I forgot them. Anyway, there, there's several. Just believe me on this one too. There's all kinds of references to Bible accounts, Bible, just all kinds of stuff that, that we, that have become commonplace in, 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 our, in our societal vernacular, if you will. And then he says that, we're ignorant of, you're ignorant of yourself if you don't know the Bible. Why is that? Where else do we get what the Bible tells us? The Bible is the only place where we can find where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Now, that sounds like a religious -y statement. But give me some, something else that tells you that. I mean, no other religious text answers those questions. They'll answer some of them, two out of three of them sometimes. But... The Bible is the only source that you can say, here's your origin, here's your purpose, and here's what's going to happen at the end. So that's, that, that's why this guy says, you're ignorant of yourself if you don't know something about the Bible. Um, I gave several of you, four or five of you at least, some different verses. No other book can do this. And, and, and we know this, right? I mean, we, we're the people who should know this. But we also, we know that the Bible is life-changing. And this is the thing, this is the, the meat of the message that we have to get into the people around us. That, that the Bible isn't just a collection of old man-made stories or a bunch of words or all those different things. It is something that can change your life. Romans 1.16, this is what Paul says in Romans 1.16. It is, oh, go ahead, finish. That this written word, this gospel, is what, what God uses to save us. It's what God, this is, the, this is the tool that God uses to save us. It's where, where we get the information. Uh, Psalm 119, 130. Uh, 
It gives light and understanding. You think this world, this culture we live in doesn't want some light and understanding? And what, what, what we, I, sh- I can't say we, what I tend to do is I talk to people about the Bible as a book of here's how you're supposed to live your life. Here's the rules you're supposed to follow. It gives you light and understanding and how to live that life. Uh, John 17, 17 says, that's Jesus, sanctify them in truth. And then you, you could pause and go, what's the truth? And he says it, your word, Jesus says, the words that are going to be in this book that these guys are going to finish. That's what truth is. Um, John 8, 31 and 32. It's what makes you free. Jesus says, my words are truth, and that truth is what's going to make you free. Do you think if that's how we approached a culture who doesn't want to know anything about the Bible, if we said, listen, this is the thing that will make you free. Don't, don't go out and say, this, this is going to tell you why you can't do that, and you can't do that, and that's why you shouldn't do that, and that's why you can't live with that person, that's why you can't do that. Just say, this, this is what's going to make you free. This is what's going to give you light and guidance. They'll figure all that stuff out if, if, they, if we can get people to open this. And like I said, the statistics show us that people want to know what's in here. <laughs> so we have to get this message out. And yes, we need to get the message out about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We need to get the message out about the importance and the necessity of baptism and, and how that is your relationship with God. But the first thing we have to do is let people know that this book is, is the light, that this book is where they're going to find it. This book is, 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 has, has the ingredients to help them better their lives. Um, and, and I'm going to be straight with you when we think about this. Considering this, these, this evidence, these, this scientific research, I mean, it, they didn't survey the whole world. I get that. But could it be possible? Could it be possible that we've convinced ourselves that our culture doesn't want the Bible? Because these statistics say they do. And I ask that with, I mean, I'm pointing at myself too. Because if, if we can agree that culture can change, and if we agree that culture wants to know what's in the Bible, who's going to show them? We are. And is it maybe that we've just, well, they don't want to know what's in there anyway, so pff, I don't have to talk to anybody about my faith. It's an easy way out to say they don't want to know anyway. These statistics t- say the exact opposite. And especially this younger generation that we sometimes think they don't want to know anything about the Bible. They want to know more than we do, people my age. So we can't write them off. We can't write anybody off because these, this research shows people have some interest in the Bible. We can't be cowardly about it and go, well, they don't want to know, so I don't have to talk about the Bible. Nobody wants to know that anyway. That's wrong. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. What Nathan's saying is you think of what, what Paul said, be, be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. This, this may be a time frame that we're in season. And, and, and we, I mean, when things are in season, you go pick, right? It's that, that's when it's time to go get it. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially denying God when you immediately conclude that. Yeah, that's exactly what what uh, Zach's saying is that when when we say nobody wants to hear and I can't do it anyway, we're basically just telling God no. That's what it comes down to. We're saying you know I like, but 
I, I even want to get broader picture than that. I mean, I'm not talking about sitting down with somebody having a Bible study and saying, we need to look at Acts 2.38, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We need to look at all these different verses. I'm saying, read this Bible. That's the easiest thing in the world. I mean, at, at least show them that, hey, that this, this is not just a book of don'ts. That this is, this is a way that God has said, I want to shine some light. I want to do the Psalm 119, 105. I want to be the lamp to your feet and a light to your way. And we'll figure it out from there, right? Okay, so the next question, which was supposed to be about 20 minutes ago, is what do we do? So what we'll do next week is we'll continue with this idea. And I'm going to talk about some specific tools that we can use. And then the sub question with this whole thing is, well, how do we know what's true and what isn't true? When w there's a lot of people who use this same apparatus here, this same book, and you say one thing and this guy says something else. So is, is there really any truth? Any thoughts? I just feel like I'm shooting at you with it. Pew, pew, pew. Anybody? Okay, thanks very much. We'll pick up right there next week.